So let's take a look at the regulation of the ventilatory cycle and then go into the triphasic response. What we need to remember is that there are no receptors for oxygen in your body and you don't ventilate because of the change of concentration of oxygen or the need for oxygen ever. The contraction and relaxation pattern of the ventilatory muscles will be regulated by the respiratory centers of the pons and the medulla. In particular, sensors within the pons in the pneumotaxic and aponeustic center, and then nuclei within the medulla in the dorsal respiratory ganglion and ventral respiratory ganglion, which will lead to changes in the action potentials being sent by the phrenic nerve to the uh, diaphragm and the other respiratory muscles. We have distinct regulators for normal ventilation. In the aponeutic and pneumotaxic centers, we're going to get a change in signaling where we'll either increase respiratory rate or decrease respiratory rate based off of the signalings heading out to them. We will also have central regulation, such as thought or cognition patterning, and we'll have proprioceptors. In this case here, the principal proprioceptors that we're dealing with in normal respiration is an automatic stop to ensure that we don't have overinflation of the lungs. So let's take a look at what's going on within the respiratory center. The respiratory center will be registering normal blood chemistry, but will also be receiving uh, cognitive input, such as hold your breath or take your breath. The blood chemistry is going to be registering changes in bicarbonate and changes in carbon dioxide, as well as changes in the concentration of hydrogen donors or Lewis acids within the blood. These are going to interact with the rhythmic center, which will send a signal to the VRG, which causes the diaphragm to contract, leading to normal rhythmic breathing. When we have an increase of chemicals within the blood that we have to get rid of, such as bicarbonate or carbon dioxide or hydrogen ions, the aponeustic center sends secondary signals to the DRG to increase the force rate. The aponeustic and pneumotaxic centers will inhibit each other within the normal signaling whenever we have the increase of acids or carbon dioxide within the bloodstream where the aponeustic center is going to register for more breathing, whereas the pneumotaxic center is going to inhibit more breathing. It basically acts as a stop to ensure that we do not have excessive ventilation occurring. But what happens when we have some sort of stressor? In the ventilatory system, we end up having what's referred to as the triphasic response. The triphasic response is made up of the anticipatory set, the neurogenic response, and the metabolic response. All of these will lead to either a change in tidal volume or a change in respiration rate. The anticipatory set is an increase of cognitive control to the aponeustic center that leads to an increase of firing in the DRG we see an increase of respiration rate more than an increase of tidal volume. And it usually occurs prior to any type of exertion. It's done in an attempt to increase plasmal pH so as to offset any accumulation of hydrogen ions or hydrogen donors that will occur during activity or exertion. The next stage is the neurogenic stage. The neurogenic stage occurs when we have an increase of cognitive functioning and an increase of proprioceptive feedback. We see this both during as well as prior to any type of exertion. We very rarely see the neurogenic post-exertion. It's done in response to proprioceptive feedbacks coming from muscle activity in the extremities. It's associated with the alarms of sales response to the stress. In this case here, we see a, a continual increase in respiration rate, but we start seeing an increase in tidal volume. The increase in tidal volume here is larger than what we saw with the anticipatory set, but is much less than what we see with the metabolic response. So let's take a look at what's going on in terms of the change in normal ventilatory cycle 
when we have the anticipatory or the neurogenic response. In this case here we have an awareness to stress. The awareness to the stress leads to higher cortical input to the respiratory centers, which leads to increased firing in both the VRG and the DRG. The aponeustic center becomes more active than the pneumotaxic center, which means that we have more inhibition heading to the pneumotaxic center, allowing for additional DRG firing. This causes an increase in diaphragm contraction, as well as an increase in accessory and inspiratory muscle contractions. The end result here is an increase in the rate, more than an increase in tidal volume, leading to a total increase in the volume of air moving. There can be a problem here, particularly if we have hyperventilation, as we are going to be exhaling too much carbon dioxide and too many of the um, chemicals that can act as basic molecules within the plasma neutralize any of the acids that could be accumulating. The last of the triphases, triphasic response is going to be the metabolic response. The metabolic response is going to be seen late, during, and following exertion. It's done in response to accumulation of volatile metabolic products that need to be excreted. The lungs are the principal site for excretion of volatile metabolic products. In this case here, the increase, and it's a drastic increase, in carbon dioxide and bicarbonate as well as hydrogen donating molecules, Lewis acids, that accumulate within the plasma that occur as a result of the increased metabolism seen with the exertion. In this case here, we have a much larger aponeustic response. In fact, the aponeustic response that we see in the metabolic response counteracts any pneumotoxic center signaling that could be occurring and it leads to an increase in both the respiration rate as well as the tidal volume due to a drastic change in thoracic volumes. And we'll get to why when we look at the gas laws. So let's take a look at what's going on in terms of the metabolic response. So we have a drastic increase in bicarbonate H2CO3, carbon dioxide, as well as bicarbonate the HCO3 negative, which is the basic of the bicarbonate, and is um, there as a um, buffer for the increase of hydrogen ions or donors, or the increase in acidic compounds that we see following metabolic exertion. So we end up getting, we end up getting a drastic change in blood chemistry, as well as the continuous input of higher cortical signals going to the ventilatory centers. This leads to a drastic increase in aponeustic response, which means that we get a larger DRG interaction along with the continual signaling on the VRG. This leads to both the increase of rate as well as the increase of tidal volume. This is where following an exertion you start breathing much deeper and much rapidly and the deepness and the rapidness of the ventilation leads to the greater level of gas exchange that occurs as we have larger amounts of um, thoracic volume changes. This is seen following exertion to a larger degree than during exertion. So what are going to be some of the chronic adaptations that we see due to the triphasic response? Well we're going to see a change in total ventilatory exchange that means that we're going to be able to move more air following than we could before and during. Chronically, we're going to see this increase uh, amount of air that we're able to move at rest as well as following activity and during activity. It's the change that we see is principally going to be seen with an increase of compliance as well as a modification of those factors that allow for larger volumes to move at any type of um, ventilation. This chronic change leads to an increase of VO2 max and an increase of functional vital capacity. The functional vital capacity that we're talking about here is the maximum amount of air that we can move within a single cycle. We're not talking about the mathematical vent, uh, vital capacity. 
we're talking about how much can you actually move given a single breath. Note that we are going to be able to work towards maximal anatomical capacity and that any change we see with VO2 max is going to be accompanied with improvement of mitochondrial functions at the tissues. This VO2 max is a measurement of your ability to inhale and exhale gases as well as perform aerobic metabolism at the tissues. It's not just how much air can you move. So things that we need to think about here in terms of ventilation and the triphasic response. First, what changes in ventilation occur during anticipation and neurogenic phases? What harm might come from the increase in respiration rate, but not an accompanying tidal volume? What is the difference in ventilation that changes from a metabolic phase within the process versus what's seen in either anticipation or the neurogenic phase? And why does ventilation change following activity?